device is off. Let's try this again. Ah, better. Okay. So the this is the last lecture in the series on algebraic K theory. And what I want to do, I'm going to start by cleaning up uh, <laughs> some of my imprecisions. I mean, there are perhaps many, but at least some of the more salient ones. Um, and then I want to finish by talking about the properties uh, of higher algebraic K theory, um, notably the antivity theorem, the approximation theorem, and sort of how to think about what the S dot construction is doing. Now, one thing that I regret is that I really haven't gotten into anything of the sort of modern theory of how we compute algebraic K theory. Um, and I'll perhaps try to say a little bit about this at the end. Um, but we'll see. Anyway, so let me get started with the cleanup operation. So, so these are two, two things I wanted to say, one that I forgot and one that uh, I got confused. So if you remember, uh, I botched the end of the proof of the fried Mitchell embedding theorem yesterday. Right? There's this question about, so we had, so recall, we were proving or discussing the outline of the proof of Fried Mitchell. And what this said was that a small abelian category is a full subcategory of a category of modules. Right? And what had we done? Well, we had, you know, we had taken uh, C and we had mapped C to, you know, functors uh, from C op to abelian groups. And then I asserted that you factor this, or it's straightforward to check that the representable functors are left exact. And so this factors through left exact functors. And the point about L was, so that was, that was good. And so what's true is that L is, uh, called a Grotendieck abelian category. And L has a, uh, let's say, an injective generator given by the direct sum of the uh, image of C under the Oneida embedding. OK, so we got this far, and that's, that's all well and good. So now if we consider L op, this has a projective generator. And given a projective generator, of course, I can produce a ring. The projective generator is, you know, is the uh, opposite of the inductive, injective generator. Well, it has a projective generator, which we'll call G. And we have a ring, if we look at HOM, in L op from G to G. This, of course, is a ring, right? This is an, this is an endomorphism object in an additive category. So this is a, a group, and the composition makes this into a ring. Uh, and so our candidate category of modules, of course, is HOM L op G G mod, right? That's the category of modules that should, we should, where we want to end up. And the one thing that I screwed up was that, and there's some question about, is this a compact generator? And the answer is no, never. Right? This is, I mean, yeah, this is, of course, never a compact object. But that's fine. The point is not, right, we're not going to identify L op as a category of modules. But if you remember from the talk on Morita theory, we have a natural functor into modules over this thing. Namely, we look at the functor from L op to hom. L op G G mod. And what's the functor? It's, you know, M goes to hom L op G M. Right? We just look at the functor that's homming from the generator into our thing. And of course, that has an action of this thing on the left. And now what you check, so now, we, now we've constructed a composite functor, right? C went into L op and uh, 
Okay. LOP goes into the category of modules over this ring, and now what you check is that that's, the desire, that that's actually a, a fully faithful and exact embedding. Okay, and that's, that's, that's the end of the proof of the theorem. Okay, so that was cleanup operation number one. The other thing that I forgot to mention and had wanted to is, if you recall, so we had these different setups. So if we have, let's say, uh, A, is an exact category, or maybe even A is an abelian category, then on the one hand, we can define directly k0 of A, right? So we have k0 of A. Defined directly. But you note that we have a functor, right? So at some point during the last lecture, we made this move where we transitioned from talking about things that looked like abelian categories or pieces of abelian categories to things that were more homotopical. And in the algebraic context, more homotopical meant uh, chain complex, right? So we have a functor from A to bounded complexes on A for instance. And, you know, or we might have a functor from proj um, R in particular to the bounded complexes of projective R modules. And what is this functor, right? This just takes uh, M to the complex, which has M in degree 0, and 0 is everywhere else, right? It's the obvious inclusion. And the thing that you would want to check, and of course we can define, so you know, let's bounded complexes on proj R is a Waldhausen category where the weak equivalences are the quasi-isomorphisms and the cofibrations are the injections uh, with co-kernel in proj R. I mean the level-wise, I should say injections with, with suitable co-kernel. And now, the thing that you might want to check, or you might worry about in any event, is that so we want to know, or let's say lemma, the inclusion of k0 of proj r, k0 bounded complexes on R is an isomorphism. Okay, this is a vital consistency check, right? It would be a sorry thing if I souped up my algebraic category into a homotopical category and suddenly the answer changed. Okay, so how do you prove this? Well, you have a functor this way given by the inclusion, right? There's not the, the inclusion functor obviously induces a, a map on K0. How do you go back? So, you know, what's, what's the proof? You, we're going to produce a functor back. So we're going to produce this functor going back. And how do I do that? Supposing I have a complex of modules and I'd like to get a single, mo a single class in K0 out of it. What do I do? I mean, we, only, you know, we, ha we already have, right? We know about a function that does that, a construction, namely the Euler characteristic. Right? So the map back, like this, k0 of proj r, uh, I guess maybe erase and put this here, this map is given by the map that takes a complex to its Euler characteristic, regarded as a k0 class. So it's induced from the map that takes, uh, you know, 0. Let's just write it as mi goes to the sum over i of minus 1 to the i of the k0 class of mi. OK? And clearly, if I go that way and back, that's the identity. If I go that way and that way, uh, that's not the identity. 
And it's a good exercise, which will come out of something that I'll talk about a little bit later, to actually check that that induces an isomorphism on K-theory. So exercise show these are inverses. So on K0, this is an exercise. This is actually true on the higher K-theory spectrum as well. That's hard. Um, and that's something called the gillet waldhausen theorem, or gillet thomas and waldhausen theorem, to show that that extends. So it's true for K1, for instance. Uh, not least. OK, so that ends the cleanup operation, I think. And I now want to return to talking about higher algebraic K-theory and the S-dot construction. So let's recall where we were. So I have C is a Waldhausen category. And remember, that means that C has weak equivalences, C has cofibrations, and these satisfy some axioms that we wrote down last time. Now, I had a construction, Sn of C. And this was functors from the category Ij, where uh, there's a map from Ij to I prime, J prime, if I is less than or equal to I prime, and J is less than or equal to J prime. Which, as described last time, you can think of the arrows in the category associated to the poset with n elements uh, ordered by less than. Now, what the S-dot construction was is it was a functor from this category uh, to C. And what did the functor look like? Right, it was specified by the following data. We had ij uh, goes to aij such that 1 aii uh, equals the point. And I guess I should say here that i is less than or equal to j. aii is the point. 2, the map from aij to aik for j less than or equal to k is a cofibration. And three, and remember, what was this doing? This is a sequence of cofibrations and choices of cofiber, specified choices of quotient. And those specified choices of quotient are given by the last axiom, which says that if we have aij and there's a cofiber to, or cofibration to aik, if we take the map induced to ajk, and we factor that through a j j, which is the point by this axiom that this is a pushout. Okay, that was the data of a Waldhausen category, and the thing you observe. So a first thing to note was that if C is a Waldhausen category, then Sn of C is a Waldhausen category. So what are the maps? Remember, the maps look like transformations of, or natural transformations of diagrams. Right? If you think about this as functors, they're transformations of diagrams. So in here, the maps from Aij to Bij are just the collection of compatible maps from Aij to Bij. Right? It's just pointwise. It's what you think. And such with the dot relevant diagram you draw commutes. Now, how do we put a Waldhausen structure? So the question is, how does SNC inherit a Waldhausen structure? And the answer is as follows. So. And I should say that this is an example of an interesting question that you should ask yourself in the context of any of these models of axiomatic homotopy or abstract homotopy theory, right? So we talked about model categories. And one thing you might wonder is, supposing I have a category of diagrams, so maps from a small category into a model category, things of the shape of pushouts, let's say. 
or things of the shape of chains, uh, you know, direct limit chains. So I have some sort of functor from a diagram to a model category. You might wonder, when is that a model category? And this came up in discussion of when, and this comes up when you think about homotopy limits and colimits from this perspective. And we're, we're asking sort of a version of that question, because this SNC is something, is a subcategory of a diagram category, and we're wondering when does that inherit uh, an abstract homotopy theory? And the answer here is always. And the way you define it is that, you know, in SNC, sort of weak equivalences are pointwise, by which I mean that each AIJ BIJ is an equivalence. Okay, so that's very natural. The cofibrations are slightly more complicated. So what we need is that AIJ, if we look at the diagram, AIJ to A uh, IK, and we have A, sorry, BIJ, BIK, if we have this diagram. What we ask is, so, so I'm now looking at a little piece, right? This is a little piece of, the, of what the data that specifies the map between two things. If I look at this, I'm going to ask that, uh, you know, A, I, J, let's just do this in the top row, actually. So, zero I. And this is zero. Let's even just do it one across. And this is zero i. And this is zero i plus one. What we're going to ask is that the map from a zero i to b zero i is a cofibration, and what gets called a latching map. So if you've seen Reedy categories, this is going to look like a very normal condition. But there's an induced map. If you think about this diagram, there's an induced map from the pushout p. Right, the pushout sits there, and there's a map like that. And I mean that's always true. And we're going to ask that the map from p to b zero i plus one is also a cofibration. Okay, and that's the data. Now, why did why would we do this? And what I really mean by asking why would we do this is what axiom are you going to need this kind of thing for? So let me leave that as an exercise. This is a good question to ask yourself. What goes wrong with the, what I might call, the naive or pointwise cofibrations? I'm sorry? Yeah, you have you're going to have trouble. If you, if you, what, you know, what could go wrong? You want to go through and verify the various axioms. And you're going to have trouble with gluing if you don't have something like this. And this is a, this is a nice. This is a nice little exercise to do to familiarize yourself with these. Um, OK, so we have a Waldhausen category. And the point, as we discussed last time, the point of the S dot construction is that this assembles, right? Sort of the whole point is that n to Sn of c, this data assembles into a simplicial Waldhausen category. OK? And what were the structure maps supposed to be? So they are, you know, again, they're driven by, and we talked about this last time a little bit, so maybe I won't write this again, but they're driven by the desire to, well, maybe I will write this. So let's, let's just do one of the examples. So if we have a, a point to A01 to A02, these should be cofibrations, sorry. Um, and now we have a point, and now we go to A, one, two, and we go down like that. And of course, we ask that this be a push out, and now we have a point here. So here's our triangular diagram. This is a diagram in S2, right? So I would note, incidentally, looking at this, what does this tell you? What is the category S2? And maybe this is actually worth a digression. Um, where we have room for this. So S0 of C uh, you know, is trivial. S1 of C is just 
the objects of C, right? What is S2 of C? S2 of C is uh, cofiber sequences, right? That's exactly the data you've got here. S2 of C is cofiber sequences. And I mention this because we're going to check in just a second that you can recover the definition of K0 that we know and love at this point from the S dot construction. And of course, the reason you can do that is that the S dot construction has built into it information about the cofiber sequences. Right? That's one of the ways to think about what the data in this construction is. Now, the other thing to say, and this is sort of a philosophical remark, which maybe I think given sort of uh, time available, I won't make more precise or specific than what I'm about to say, but think about what we needed to do the S dot construction. All we needed was to know, which, to be able to identify which squares were homotopy pushouts. That's it. Right? And this whole business about weak equivalence, sorry, not weak equivalences, the whole business about cofibrations is scaffolding to say which squares are homotopy pushouts. And that's actually not a bad way to think about model categories. Right? Model categories are scaffolding to talk about homotopy limits and homotopy colimits. Now, if you had other ways to talk about this, like the Dwyer consimplicial localization, as I discussed a little bit last time, you could also use that data instead. And you could define other kinds of ways of constructing the s-dot construction and algebraic k theory. Um, this can be productive because sometimes, well, sometimes it, you know this is a rigid model, and sometimes it's nice to have to have sort of homotopic. Well, you're, it's a rigid model of a homotopical condition, and sometimes it's nice to deal with the homotopy theory directly. Um, okay, so returning to this, so in this example, you know what are the different things you might do? Well. You know, we can either remove one of, the, one of the things is to remove this row and this column, right? And that just gives us this object. And the other one is essentially to quotient through by A01 on the top row, right? And that quotienting through, that just means sort pull out this. Okay? And those are the two simplicial, those are the two degeneracies. The face maps are just, uh, you just insert identities. And so again, the hard degeneracy map, you can always compose out. Right? The hard degeneracy map is the one that's quotienting the top row through by the first guy. And in these triangular diagrams, that just means take the bottom part, just remove the top row. Right? Okay, so we have this simplicial Waldhausen category, and now we're going to do the following thing. So we have another construction. So we have the nerve. And we've seen this, but let me review this just so that you know what I mean when I write the notation. So I'm going to write, if C is any category uh, with weak equivalences, and there's nothing magic about weak equivalences. I could do this for any distinguished subcategory of maps. Then nw dot C is the simplicial uh, it's not a simplicial category, or I don't want to think of it as such. It's a simplicial set where n goes to the set of tuple, you know, chains c0, c1, cn of weak equivalences. It's possible I made a fence post error, and that should be cn minus 1. Um, so, and here, the faces in degeneracy, so this is the nerve of the category, right? We've seen this construction already in some of the student talks. And what are the faces in degeneracies? They're either insert identity or compose out. So they're the same sort of as the, as the uh, things in this S dot construction. And so now I make it, I'm now in a position to make a definition. Yes. So this is not a... So I just mean the nerve with respect to the sub the nerve of this subcategory is all that means. I'm not doing this is not well what to say. So on the, the first thing to say is that everything goes forward. I'm not explicitly doing any kind of construction like the Dwyer Kahn hammocks. It is the case that if you stare at these things long enough, you will see the Dwyer Kahn hammocks sort of floating off the page out of these uh, out of these diagrams, and that's for good reason. Um, but maybe, maybe I won't say more about that. Um, so, okay. Right, so now we have this definition, which was that the K-theory space 
of a Waldhausen category C was defined as loops on the geometric realization of the bisimplicial object we get by taking the nerve uh, of the S dot construction of C. Okay? And so this has PQ, you know, what does this mean? This has PQ simplices that go to the, you know, P simplices of the nerve of SQ of C. Okay, and that's a perfectly reasonable bisimplicial set. And you take the geometric realization uh, in either order, or you take the diagonal any, any way you want to do that, and we loop down. So, again, this should make the S dot construction look like a de-looping. Right? You know, you sort of you take C, you push it up, and you loop it back down. This should look like a group completion. Maybe I should say this should remind you of x goes to loops bx. Right? If x was the sort of space that had data to make sense of that. So, and that's, you know, not an accident, of course. So, let's think a little bit now about what this object looks like. So, you can build, as I said last time, you can build a spectrum out of this. And we will build that spectrum, but first, let's recover k0 out of this, right? As a basic sanity check, let me explain how you get back the original definition of k-theory that we gave. So, or of, well, of k0. Okay, so how do you do it? Well, we want to compute, you know, so the claim is that pi0 of loops of NW S dot of C is isomorphic to K0 of C. Right? That's the, that's the assertion. And how do you see this? Well, the point is that if you, this is the same thing as pi 1 of the geometric realization of NW dot of S dot of C. And for convenience, let's realize in the nerve direction. Okay, let's pass to classifying spaces. So then this just becomes a simplicial space. So realizing in the NW dot direction, what we have is a simplicial space. Maybe I should write that. A simplicial space. And what do I want to do with this simplicial space? Well, you know, one of the things you know is that uh, in that case, and this is a general fact about geometric realization of simplicial spaces, which is that, uh, you know, since the zero simplices are a point. And why are they a point, right? They're because the zero simplices are S0. There's nothing there. So that's just a point. Then pi 1 is presented by the free abelian group on pi 0 of, uh, you know, B of S1 of C, subject to the relations that d1 equals d0 plus d2 for every object in pi 0 of b s2 of c. OK? This is, this, so again, this is something that's true about the fundamental group of simplicial spaces, um, which I'm going to leave as a fact. You can check this, uh, and that's not a bad exercise. But this looks very suggestive, right? We're, at this point, having made this observation and with what's on the board, we're done. Right? What is this? What, is, what, is the, what does this mean that the objects are? It's the free abelian groups on the weak equivalence classes of objects of C, right? So let's translate, because we know what these things are. This is the translating. This is the free abelian group on weak equivalence classes in C, right? Because what is S1 of C? It's, uh, you know, it's just the object of C, and we're looking at the nerve. We've realized with respect to the nerve of the weak equivalences. And so pi 0 is just the equivalence classes. 
And what, what are the objects of S2 of Z? Well, by God, those are the exact sequences. And so what's, you know, what, are, what are we doing? We've got, uh, you know, if I have uh, A01 to A02 to their quotient, which is called A12, what are our maps? I'm saying that the map that picks out this plus the map that picks out this is equal to the map that picks out this. And that's the defining relation of K0, right? So, so you check directly that, maybe I should label these, you know, this is D1, this is uh, D0, and this is D2, or actually maybe that's the other way. Okay, so, so we get K0 back. Now, good, now I want to produce a spectrum. Which we can do using similar considerations. Right, because let's think about, so we're going to produce a map from S1 smash NW of C, which is the zero space of our candidate spectrum, into NW dot S dot of C. And this is enough, I claim. Right? Why? Because I could plug in, we know that S dot of C, Sn of C is a Waldhausen category. So of course what could happen is that I can just plug in S dot of C for C here. And so if I can produce this map, then I can produce structure maps, you know, plugging S dot of C in for C. What I get is just that we have the collection uh, nw dot s dot, dot s dot c, where this happened n times, is a pre-spectrum. Now, I'm not yet claiming anything about the adjoint of those structure maps, right? I'm not saying that those are weak equivalences. It turns out that most of them are, but that's a theorem. That's not going to follow from what I'm about to do. Um, I'll also say in passing that if you know these words, you can realize this directly as a symmetric spectrum. This is not just any old spectrum, it turns out. And that's sort of because you can uh, flip the S's around. That's, that's a, if you, well, maybe the thing to say is that's a hard but fun exercise if you really like this stuff. Um, okay, so I wanted to explain a little bit, or, you know, where does that map come from? Well, the point is just if we think about, if we're, as we build, uh, you know, the geometric realization of nw dot s dot of c. The point is that, if remember, s1 was just the weak equivalences, right? And so if you look at s1, you know, nw dot c, this is, this is the same thing as nw dot s1 of c, right? And so this thing lives inside this geometric realization. And how does it live there? Well, this is the, you know, this is the one level. So I'm attaching this thing. So when I build this, I attach this thing cross delta 1 to the 0 level, which is a point. right? So I take my interval and I glue the two ends around to the point. Well, what am I saying? I'm really saying that you know, nw dot c smash s1 includes uh, into the, the one skeleton of this thing. And that's all the structure map is. Okay, so, just, so you just look at the geometry of what you're building, of the definition of the geometric realization, and you have this structure map. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the K theory spectrum. And I should make a note about its functoriality, right? You might always wonder, or what you should always wonder, what is the functoriality of these things? And if we have to, we have f from c to d, and c to d 
or Waldhausen, uh, f is exact if it preserves all relevant structure. What does that mean? It preserves weak equivalences, it preserves co-fibrations, it preserves push-outs, it preserves the point, right? It, takes the, it preserves the structure of a Waldhausen category. And the fact now, and this, I say this isn't really a fact, you can check this immediately, is that, you know, K-theory is a functor from Waldhausen categories and exact functors to spectra. So what have I done, right? This is strange. What have we done, I should say? It's been a collaborative enterprise of sorts. We've taken homotopical data, and at the end of the day, we produced a cohomology theory. And that cohomology theory turns out to be really interesting. So let's look at a few, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say about this before giving you a few examples. Um, yeah, so this is probably a good time to say some things. So, so you'll notice maybe that in the course of do doing this lecture, I gave you some examples at the beginning, sort of, of K0. But I really haven't said anything recently about computations. And so I might say, for instance, that, you know, what might we compute? So here's some things we might be interested in. The k-theory of the integers, z, which you might expect might know something about number theory. Uh, the k-theory of the sphere spectrum, right? That's everyone's favorite ring spectrum. So one of the things that I haven't said anything about, but I will now assert, is that just as you can talk about modules over a ring, uh, we can now talk in a good way about modules over a ring spectrum. And so, yeah? Yeah. So the space, the K-theory space is the zero space of, so it's going to turn out in a second that this is actually, um, this construction is an omega spectrum except at level one uh, in general, sometimes even there. And what is the K-theory space? It's the de-looping of the one space, right? I've looped down the one space, and so that's actually the zero space of the K-theory spectrum as an omega spectrum. So you, the K-theory space is good enough to compute the homotopy groups of the spectrum. But if you have a spectrum around, it's always better to have the spectrum than to have the space um, for various reasons. Okay, so I can talk about modules over a ring spectrum. And, you know, they, I, think so, I think Mark actually wrote down the, the definition of this, or I hope he did. Um, but it's just the definition of a module, right? Only you use the smash product rather than the tensor product. And projective, what does projective mean? It means something like, a, you know, compact object in the sense that was talked about a little bit. Or retract or free, and free might really mean wedge sum and, or, you know, or a generalization of that. So we can ask about the k-theory of the sphere spectrum. We might ask more generally about the k-theory of the suspension spectrum with a disjoint base point of loops x for x is space. Now this is a generalization of this example, right? If x is a point, we recover the sphere spectrum. This is, as I indicated earlier, this should remind you of the Whitehead group, right? You know, what is, you know, pi 1 of this This is essentially the Whitehead group. Or it's related to, you know, z, uh, closely related to z loop uh, pi 1 of x. So this, this captures our geometric examples. Um, we might ask about k-theory of ku, or k-theory of mu, right? Any, any ring spectrum you know about, you can ask about the k-theory. OK, so now I have sad news. So we don't know completely the answers for the k-theory basically for any of these things. It's really hard to compute. Of course, we know partial information. But for instance, if we knew this, that would be the same as the resolution of the Van Diver conjectures in number theory. If we knew that that was, uh, I think, zero at, you know, place at multiples of four. We know K1, th K0 through K5, I think, completely. And I think we know some other K groups. Um, but it's hard. The K-theory of the sphere spectrum, uh, John Rognes has written a series of very beautiful papers calculating all sorts of things about its homotopy groups. But we don't really have a very good conceptual handle on what this is in some ways. 
This, Waldhausen proved that this is something called, this is essentially equivalent to something called the Whitehead spectrum, or the, you know, the, or the space of uh, uh, the stable pseudo-isotopy. And so, so it's closely related to a construction and manifold geometry. But again, it's not very easy to compute most of the time. And these two things, this we know something about the homotopy groups of, and this we know almost nothing, well, we know relatively little about. So it's a tremendous, anything you can compute is a tremendous enterprise. So in some sense, the message here, I think, is much more despondent than uh, the message of, say, Mark's talks, where the answer is there's this wonderful algebraic machinery that lets us compute all sorts of stuff. Here, I mean, there is, in fact, wonderful algebraic machinery that lets us compute things, but it's much less effective than in the case of these, these sort of more classical computations of homotopy groups or stable homotopy groups of finite complexes. Okay, so, you know, these might be, these aren't exercises, but, uh, you know, <laughs> if you could do it, that would be great. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about, so what's the point of all of this? Um, I'm always saying what's the point of all this, but I mean, what I really mean is I want to talk about what properties this thing has. Uh, because one question you want to ask is, in what way does this thing reflect structural properties of the category of Waldhausen categories? It's a very natural question. And the first thing to show or to say is that, you know, the first, one of the first things I told you was that K-theory was about splitting exact sequences. And so you want to know how does that manifest in this context? And actually, maybe I don't want to erase these things. Let's push this back up and write this here. So the theorem, the most important theorem in some sense about the properties of algebraic K-theory is that, and this is called the additivity theorem, is that the K-theory of S2 of C is equivalent to the K-theory of C cross the K-theory of C. Okay, and what's, why is this about splitting exact sequences? Well, S2 of C, that's the exact sequences. And, you know, the map that induces this is the one that pulls off the things on the ends. Okay, so I'm going to prove this for you for K0, where we can see it very directly. The proof for higher K-theory uh, requires more machinery. So let's, but let's do the K0 case. So... So maybe I should write that slogan, which is that K-theory splits exact sequences, once again. OK, so proof uh, for K0. So here the statement is that the K0 K of S2 of C is isomorphic to K0 of C cross K0 of C. And in order to do this, I need to tell you something about what the functors are, the maps are that are inducing these equivalences. So, you know, you know what they are, right? You could figure this out, of course. We have a map. If we have a, uh, you know, 0, 1 to a 0, 2 to a 1, 2, right? This is the data we have. How are we going to get over to here? Well, we're going to pull off, we have the map that takes this to class of A01 and the class of A12, right? That's a perfectly good map from here to here. Okay, and we have a map that goes back. And what's the other map? Which is it takes, uh, let's say, A and uh, B, maybe rather, we'd rather have C. Uh, maybe we wouldn't rather have C. Uh, so it takes A and B, goes to, what's the exact sequence? It's going to go, of course, to A, to A, uh, push out B, to B. Now, notice that to make sense of this, I'm implicitly using the properties of Waldhausen categories, right? Because you need to, you know, the identity map is a cofibration, and this is a co-base change of that cofibration. Right? But you had to do something to know that this was, a this was a cofibration. And a similar calculation tells you that the uh, quotient of these things is actually B. Okay? So that's a nice exercise, very small exercise to check that this makes sense. So what this says is that we have a split injection. 
right, if you think about this. So we just need to show that we get everybody. And so I'm going to write So we have a split injection. And so to finish, I'm going to write uh, a class a01, a02, a12. I'm going to write this guy, or the class of that guy, as a sum of the image of classes classes coming from K0C cross K0C. OK, that's what I got to do. So how do I do it? Well, let me just draw the picture, or the diagram, anyway. So the diagram uh, looks something, a little something like this. It's going to be a01 to A01 to the point, and then A01 to A02 to A12, and then the point to uh, A12 to A12. Right, and what's happening here, uh, I need this, well, what I'm doing is I'm taking the image of the sum of A01 in this, so I'm taking, this is our guy, right, and I've written this in terms of an exact sequence in S2, therefore as a sum in K0 of S2, involving the image of, a zero, of the point in A01 and the point in A12. Right, this, the top row, comes from you know, A01 and the point, and this bottom row comes from the point and A12, and this gives rise to the sum in K0 of S2 of C. Okay, and that's the argument. So this establ again something well a much harder argument establishes this for the K theory spectrum, but this is the fundamental defining property of K theory, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a second. I want to say something else about sort of the other important property uh, that we know. So. Here's a question. When does an exact functor f from C to D, where these are Waldhausen categories, induce an equivalence k of C to k of D, by which I mean a stable equivalence of spectrum? Right, that's a very, again, I'm asking, well, the additivity question is one that's motivated by our background, that we know the sort of underlying narrative here has to do with splitting exact sequences. Whereas this question is just the kind of thing you always should ask, which is what, what conditions do you need on your input data to get the same output? Right, this is a very basic question. And this has a cool answer. Um, there are various different ways of saying this. There are lots of ways of saying this. So, your first guess might be that suppose that f from c to d, so if you, this preserves weak equivalences. So f induces, let's observe, that f induces uh, a map ho c to ho d, right? Via the, the universal property of those constructions and the fact that f preserves weak equivalences. So you might think, OK, maybe it's enough for this to be an equivalence of categories to induce uh, an equivalence on k-theory. 
And that's almost true, but not in general. So their hypotheses are interesting and reasonable hypotheses under which this is true. Um, for instance, if you're a category of complexes and your functor is of a special type, um, or if you're stable. But in general, this is almost enough, but not quite in general. But what is true, so let's ask a richer question. Right? What's the issue? Why might you be worried about this statement? So this seems like a wonderful optimistic statement. But you might be concerned, because K-theory was about homotopy pushouts, and we had some discussion about the fact that it's not very easy to recover homotopy co-limit data just knowing the homotopy category. And not very easy is maybe sort of an overstatement. So, or understatement, I guess. Um, so instead, we can ask, the, or the answer is, if f induces an equivalence, a DK equivalence, from the Hannock localization of C to the Hannock localization of D. So this is a very natural and wonderful answer, right? What is this saying? This says that if C and D present the same homotopy theory in a, in a, in a rich sense, including homotopy co-limits, then they present the same K-theory or they give rise to the same K-theory. So K-theory, what's the slogan that you should get from this? K-theory, let me just write algebraic K-theory, is an invariant of the homotopy theory of module categories. Okay, that's what this is telling you, right? Our input, it'll turn out that our input is basically, except this isn't quite true. There are interesting examples where the input isn't, really isn't a module category. But a lot of the time, our input, most of the time maybe, our input is a module category. And what we're saying is that we're detecting the homotopy theory of that. Right, this is an invariant in some sense of sort of an enriched or enhanced version of the derived category of an object, whenever you can make sense of that. OK, so this is called, incidentally, this is a form of what gets called Waldhausen's, I should say this. This is a form of what gets called the approximation theorem. Waldhausen gave a much more sort of bare bones and uh, awesome formulation of this, which uses somehow the minimal amount of data you need. Um, but uh, you know, as uh, cultured sophisticates, maybe we would say it this way. OK. so. I now want to talk a little bit about consequences of the additivity theorem. So one thing the additivity theorem says, a consequence of the additivity theorem is the following thing, which is that suppose I have functors, I have what I call an exact sequence of functors. And this is a sequence of functors from C to D. And what I want that to mean is just that this takes, if you have a single object and I plug it into these functors, what I get out is a short exact sequence. And we have a motivating example of this, right, which is, oh, I should, well, let me tell you about the motivating example, and then I'll tell you what the edit additivity theorem says. So the example that we might care about is the identity to the cone to the suspension. And this is in a case when we, if we have factorization. And remember, with factorization, if I take the fold map and I factor it through this object CA, I get something called the cone that I'm going to call the sorry the cylinder. And if I quotient out one side of the cylinder, I get the cone. And if I quotient out the other side, I get the suspension. Okay. So if I take A to CA to 
a point. That should be the cone. And the cofiber is the suspension. So what the additivity theorem says, and so this is an exact sequence of functors. And what the additivity theorem says is that in this situation, uh, the induced map on K theory of F2 is homotopic to the sum of the induced map of F1 with the induced map of F3. And why, what do I mean by the sum? Well, I'm in the category of spectra, and so that's a re very reasonable thing to say. Well, what does that say here? That says that, uh, you know, that says that the suspension, this, this is contractible, and so this says that the suspension is equivalent, I guess, to minus the identity, if we consider from sequence star on K theory. Okay, so what does that mean? The suspension is basically uh, you know, a, an identity and uh, automorphism to sign of, our, of the K-theory spectrum we get. Well, what that says is that right, <coughs> morally what this says, this implies that K-theory is an invariant of stable categories, at least in the presence of factorization. Right? If I invert, what have I done? I'm saying that K-theory, because of the additivity theorem, as a consequence, formally inverts the suspension for you. So even if you didn't think you were inverting the suspension, uh, in fact, you did. Right? And you know, if I take the category of spaces and I invert the suspension, what do I get? I get the category of spectra. Right? The category of spectra is, in fact, uniquely characterized, it turns out, by saying that you, if you take the category of spaces and you, form, and you force the loop suspension adjunction to induce equivalences on the homotopy category, that is the stable category. What you, the universal thing you get out of that is the stable category. Okay? So this is a surprising but interesting consequence of additivity. Now, let me say something else. Um, actually, let me say, first let me write an exercise for you, which I forgot, I apologize. An exercise is prove the approximation theorem for K0. Just as there's an easy proof of the additivity theorem for K0, there's an easy proof of, well, relatively easy proof of the approximation theorem for K0. And here again, easy means, you know, you could reasonably be expected to do it, not you should see it now. But it's a, good, it's a nice thing to think about. Um, but anyway, the additivity, the, the S dot construction, so let me say actually one other thing, which is that a consequence, which I can't really explain, or don't have time to explain, consequence of additivity is that, um, is that the K-theory pre-spectrum is an omega spectrum above degree 1. So the adjoints of those structure maps or equivalences uh, once you start using the S dot construction, basically. So, you know, what this means, for instance, is that nw dot s dot c to loops on nw dot s dot s dot c, that's an equivalence. That's what I mean by, by saying that. Now, the, there's a very nice observation, and this was probably known to Waldhausen, um, but it's first written down, I think, by Randy McCarthy. Uh, we, in some sense, which is that uh, the S dot construction is the universal construction to 
to force the additivity theorem. And let me, and let me say something precise about what I mean by that. Um, we're now at the point, as you may have noticed in these lectures, where I'm going to say a lot of stuff like this, which, of course, if you want to know about, you're going to have to do some work uh, to, either, you know, to figure out how to decipher what's going on. But this is a really nice thing to see. So suppose I have f is some functor from Waldhausen categories, let's say, to spectra any old functor. And f is, is nice in the sense that, for instance, um, you know, f, the geometric realization of f from c dot to, sorry, let me write this a little bit better, in the sense that f of c cross d should be equivalent to f of c cross f of d, so f respects Cartesian products, and I think I want you know, f of the trivial category to be the point, and maybe I want something like f of, so if I have maps of simplicial Waldhausen categories such that each level is an equivalence, then I want the geometric realization of f of c dot to be equivalent to the geometric realization of f of d dot. So this, this is compatible with geometric realization in a reasonable way. So if I, these are minimal conditions on a functor, right? If my functor is re mildly well behaved, then two things are true. f uh, of s dot of blank satisfies the additivity theorem, by which I mean that f of s2 of s dot of blank is equivalent to f of s2, sorry, f of s dot of blank cross f of s dot of blank. And f is initial, or f of s dot blank is initial in some sense. for such functors. OK? So what you are doing, and what is the additivity theorem about? It's about splitting exact sequences. So the lesson here is that somehow k-theory is produced by using the nerve construction and applying the universal thing that forces exact sequences to split. Right? This should be very satisfying as sort of an emotional thing. Right? This is, you're, no, you're doing something really natural. Like, this is a crazy construction, maybe, it looks like. But really, what you're doing is something that has a very nice conceptual interpretation. It's not crazy at all, except for the fact that you had to be, uh, you know, uh, have a lot of insight to know if the S dot construction was the right thing. Yeah? It's, it's initial for such functors that a map, except a map from F. So, so it, it is the case that k-theory is, in, in a certain sense, k-theory is the initial such functor, initial functor that satisfies additivity. But right now, what I'm saying here is just that if I take f of s dot, that's the initial functor that takes, a, that's the closest functor to f that has the additivity theorem. So it's initial in the category of functors under f. Uh, I'm sorry? Um, there's also a map from f to this, and I think if you map from f to something else, it, uh, yeah, 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 I believe that's right. So, so it's also, so as, as we're coming out in the questions, it's true, in fact, something stronger, which is that k-theory is the initial functor in a suitable sense. So I would have liked to have said more about this perspective of k-theory as being sort of an initial object um, in a suitable category of functors. It's a little bit difficult because I need to talk about the homotopy theory of module categories, the homotopy theory of Waldhausen categories in a better way to say a precise statement. And so let me just say, there is such a statement you can make. Um, it's uh, a good perspective. If you are interested, you should ask me about it. But let me say um, one or two more things about this. 
Actually, what did I want to say at this point? <sighs> yeah, there's, as always, there's too much to say. Let me, I'm going to make a strategic decision and not talk further about this sort of universal perspective on what algebraic K-theory is, and instead talk about trace methods for the last five minutes of this, uh, this lecture. I'll tell you everything there is to know about trace methods. No, let me, let me tell you something. Let me just give you some words. I mean, look, a lot of the point of this lecture is, that, is to encourage you to believe that this is a beautiful and interesting subject, which is connected to anything you might possibly be interested in, and to give you sort of things to look up to learn more. So this is going to be a uh, particularly egregious or aggressive, let's say, example of, uh, <laughs> of such a uh, pedagogical style. So I want, if I want to compute K-theory, then it turns out that the most successful way we know, for the most part, except maybe for finite fields, which Quillen computed, the most successful way we know to compute K-theory is to map to easier theories by what gets called a trace or a churn character map. Okay, So it turns out that K-theory is impossible to compute directly often, but you can map it into theories that turn out to be fairly good approximations and are much more tractable. And this is just like, the, you know, in some sense this is just like the churn character, which maps you from K topological K-theory to cohomology, right? That's the sort of prototype for this. Um, so the sort of grandfather of all of this is we can do the following. Actually, can I do this construction? I don't think I've given you enough machinery. So <laughs> maybe I leave it at that. Well, I will say that there, there are maps from K-theory to sort of TC and THH. And this is a topological version of something called cyclic homology. If you've seen that, and if you haven't, it's a good word to look up. This is a topologist's version of uh, Hochschild homology. And maybe the thing to say here, Justin, that there are maps to these theories, and these theories are tractable by methods like the ones that Mark was telling you about. So, there are, we have living amongst us modern wizards of spectral sequences who can calculate these things. In fact, maybe sitting amongst us. And, uh, and based on that, you can deduce things about what K-theory is. Um, and this is sort of modern algebraic K-theory. A lot of the part that's not about sort of figuring out structural properties, the calculational part, that's the kind of thing you like, is really about understanding these theories and this kind of trace map. And the sad thing, the thing I had wanted to say about this and I think won't just because I haven't, because of the direction we've taken, I haven't given you quite enough to make sense of this, is that like, you know, one of the other sort of underlying slogans here is that almost all of these constructions, if you push back far enough in time and sort of far, you know, simplify enough, are about linear algebra, right? You know, K1 is an obstruction to Gaussian elimination working, right? And the trace map really is about taking the trace of a matrix. All right, at some level on K1, that's sort of what it is. And you can make that precise. Um, but, uh, but I won't, and instead I think uh, I will say that I'm done. So thank you. So I should, before we, uh, not so fast, not so fast. <laughs> Maybe I'm not really done. Um, no, uh, I just wanted to say that, to thank you for attending these and listening, and also to really emphasize this is, a, this is a wonderful area. There's lots of stuff going on here. There's an active literature. This is not an area that's extremely well served by its textbooks, which is a problem. Weibel has a very beautiful textbook on algebraic K theory, but he's not a homotopy theorist. And so it treats the homotopy theory sort of as gingerly and as at a distance as he can, although if he can turn it into something algebraic, then he explains it well. Um, and there's a new book by Dundas and Goodwillie and uh, McCarthy, which, has, which is sort of a very nice compendium of lots and lots of stuff of sort of a modern view of algebraic K-theory. But nonetheless, there's lots of, you know, even that book, which is hundreds of pages and has all sorts of interesting and beautiful things in it, doesn't talk very much, for instance, about the connection to the dwyer kahn simplicial localization. But there's all this good stuff. So this is a good area to work in. Um, and, you know, I encourage you, if you're interested in this, Ask me, ask Mike, uh, you know, 
There are lots of people to ask. I think you know, Clark Barwick at MIT is doing lots of good stuff with this. Ask people to tell you what to read, because there's, there's lots to do. We could use more people. Um, OK, now I really am done. So. All right, questions, if there are any remaining. 